Greetings, the Astro 30 here, and welcome back to my electronics lab today. I've got another kit to assemble. Now, this one's a little bit different. This is an amplifier, power amplifier module, and um, the difference being is this is actually a Class A. Um, I've never actually built a Class A amplifier before, but I do know how they work. Now, this is called the 1969 amplifier, which is quite popular all over the internet and eBay and places such as that as kits. Um, and it's called 1969 because it's based on John Lindsley Hood's original design uh, called the 1969 amplifier, probably because it was um, designed in 1969. Now, John Lindsley Hood, if anyone is uh, familiar with that guy in electronics and uh, amplifiers especially, uh, was a electronics engineer, an English electronics engineer. He was born in about 1927, I think it was, and he died in 2014. So, yeah, this, these uh, um, clones, as we'll call them, these are made in China, uh, basically pay homage to that original design. So, let's actually look at the original schematic for the original John Lindsley Hood 1969 amplifier. Okay, and this is the original schematic for John Lindsley Hood's 1969 um, Class A amplifier which is capable of 10 watts. Now it runs on a single ended supply, that is it's not bipolar, you only have a VCC line and a zero volt line or ground. And it's roughly around 25 volt. Um, uses uh, two MPN output transistors, uh, the specified MJ480 here, but you can use two N3 zero double fives. Um, this is the input stage. Uh, transistor, uh, it's the generic 2N3906. Um, this is ma mainly your voltage amplifier that gives the amplifier most of its gain. Because um, this is only just really a driver for the output pair. And neither of these three transistors really produce any gain at all. So most of the gain is produced by this one single transistor over here. What, what is a Class A amplifier? Well, a Class A amplifier runs at a fairly high current at idle. That means it's always drawing current through the output stage the whole entire time because the output stage is always biased to the point of saturation. The Class B amplifiers are different. They're biased at the point of complete cutoff so that each of these transistors are off and uh, when you get an input signal, one transistor turns on for the positive, and then when it turns off, the second one turns on for the negative. But you do have a small little delay there between the, the switching action of those two transistors, and so you can end up with a crossover distortion. Class AB is a combination of the two, Class A and Class B, where it is biased to the point of just being turned on. So. Those are the differences between the output stages, uh, and Class A is called Class A because it was the first amplifier ever designed when we were talking about valve electronics here. Um, but they have the disadvantages because they're biased to the point of being hard on, that means they're drawing a lot of current all the time, you need fairly large heat sinking. And with the amplifier sitting for 20 minutes idle with no input signal, the heatsink can get fairly hot. So that makes them inefficient because most of the uh, time they're wasting power as heat. Whereas Class A B don't get hot under idle, they get hot under hard working loads. So that's the original schematic, which brings me to this circuit board that I've got here. Uh, that's because. That circuit does follow the original schematic to a point, however there are a few variations. So here's my reversed engineered schematic of that circuit board and I've got the right hand channel 
board and the left hand channel is the same but a mirror image on the PCB anyway but the circuit should still be the same now this looks terribly complicated so let's actually look at a proper drawn circuit. All right, so I took the time to actually draw the circuit out correctly and as you can see it looks pretty similar to the original one except the placement of this variable resistor is now in the positive section of the uh, supply here whereas before it was between here and ground. It doesn't really matter. Anyhow this variable resistor is adjusted so that you've got half the supply voltage on the output stage before the capacitor so we call that test point one there and you can always usually tell a class A amplifier straight away because most of them are usually single ended supply and they have an output capacitor and the uh, output before the capacitor is usually at half the VCC and this variable resistor over here is to adjust the quiescent current now uh, John Audio Tech already did a review on this particular kit two years ago and which is what inspired me to buy it, but he didn't quite understand what this uh, variable resistor was for. He said it didn't actually make any a difference to whatever he was measuring when he adjusted it. Um, that's because you're supposed to measure it through a multimeter on the in series with the VCC line here to adjust the current between, according to this, 1.8 uh, to 1.8 amps that's its quiescent idle current so 1.8 amps at idle is quite a significant amount of current draw for not doing anything and also what I found funny is this is a printout of the original eBay listing um, for the description of the item and I've written in here at the edge here what the printer cut off but it says the midpoint of their own adjustments quiescent current method that's really good English tune midpoint universal table hit no idea what that means. Voltage profile, black pen then the red pen then ground, TP1 test holes, TP1 at the output capacitor positive board, the adjustable resistor KT1, it is half of the supply voltage. Okay. That sentence basically means <clears throat> you put the red probe of your minor meter on test point one and the black probe on ground and then you adjust the uh, KT1 variable resistor for half the supply voltage. So if your voltage was 20 volts, you would expect to adjust that to 10 volt on the output. Then this line under here for the adjustment of KT2 is what is completely confusing. Modulated current, 10 amp universal table hit. I have no idea what a table hit is. Stalls. A pen then positive power supply, the other one pen then VCC terminal, adjust the adjustable resistance KT2, change the current board size. What? Okay, it took me a few minutes of rereading that several times to figure out what the hell they were talking about. What they meant was adjusting the quiescent current using a multimeter capable of measuring up to 10 amps. Uh, with the uh, probes in series with the VCC line and the power supply and then adjusting KT2 until the current changes between 0.8 and 1.8 and the reason I came up with those figures is uh, because of the parameters are as follows um, the optimal input DC voltage is between 12 and 24 volt and the adjustable quiescent current is between 0.8 and 1.8 of an amp so you'd probably adjust that to somewhere in between so I don't know about 1 amp, 1 1.2 something like that so that's what that whole entire sentence meant was adjusting this current range uh, yeah it, it's really bad chinglish um, yeah yeah it's it's just just confusing however there's one installation note uh, to take note of here not provide the schematics, well that's why I reversed engineered it. The insulation particles, Ooh. they mean the um, insulation bushings that go uh, on the screw for the um, isolation kit for the transistors, is mounted between circuit board and the angle aluminium. Now that means you put the bush on the bottom side of this aluminium bracket, 
uh, through these holes here and then the circuit board is mounted on top of it like that so you will have about a one millimeter gap between the circuit board and the bracket now that is actually correct originally John Audio Tech did assemble it that way and said it was wrong but if you don't assemble it that way you will actually make the aluminium bracket start contacting these uh, pads here which are on the top side of the board these are through holes which go plated through holes which go to the bottom so you will eventually essentially I should say short these collectors out to the bracket which is not a good idea so that's what they're talking about here is to put those insulation bushings between the heat sink bracket and the circuit board uh, ignore that other line that's not really important so that's what it is but I just found this uh, description hilarious to read because it made absolutely no sense so that's the uh, amplifier circuit and I've got an issue with the Sun at the moment uh, yeah so what I'm going to do now is warm up the soldering iron and start soldering all these stuff together now I won't solder as I go on camera or anything here I will solder up all the components by the output stage then I'll show you what I meant exactly with the uh, mounting of the uh, heatsink bracket and then we'll get up to hooking up some power to it and doing some tests okay and a short time later uh, the board's assembled apart from the output stage and it took about uh, say about half an hour I seem to have a uh, spare 100k resistor left over hmm. all right so all that remains now is to mount the heatsink bracket to the uh, circuit board with the output stage transistors now I was looking at these transistors that come with it and well, for some reason there's 24 written on the back of it and there's some brown crap here so these are apparently from Mexico and there's a D mark there these apparently are Motorola ones mm. now Motorola transistors seem to be the most faked transistors along with Toshiba and Sanken so I don't trust these to be genuine at all I just dropped one uh, so I went out to JCAR this morning and I bought four of these because I am ordering another module so I'm getting the left hand one which is the reverse mirror image of this uh, so I'll just grab those transistors and we'll compare them these are the ones I bought these are CDIL never really heard of that brand before but as far as I'm concerned Motorola have not made the 2N3055 in years so if we look at the so-called Motorola transistor compared to this uh, CDIL counterpart I can't see too many physical differences the height of the hat the two hats there they look roughly the same the uh, thickness of the mounting plate for the collector looks yeah, the same but I'm still going to use the C Dil Dilk uh, transistors instead of these so-called Motorola ones because I don't trust them as far as I can throw them and uh, well that's about as far as I can throw it so I'll put these two Motorola transistors to the side and use it in something may blow them up anyhow on with the show so we need to mount the transistors to the heatsink bracket and we need to mount the heatsink bracket to the PCB now they give you these uh, nylon isolator bushings now the way we would do this and according to what I read in the description is we put them on the underside of the bracket like that and if you actually look at the picture of the eBay item uh, you'll see there is a small gap between the bracket and the PCB so this is exactly how it's supposed to be mounted um, and then we get a trans one of our transistors the right way around and we 
make some really nasty squeaking noises. Now these have these uh, bolts have captive washers and shakeproof washers on them, which is nice. So I pass the uh, screw up through the transistor, lose my isolator, and uh, I'll take those off for now. Try and get this thing to agree with me. That's all the way in. And we just do the same all the way along for the others. And then we just marry the board up to the bracket. And uh, try and get these transistors to all line up. And I think I've got it. Just have a look down there and make sure all the isolators are in place, which they are. And then start by putting nuts on to hold it, and then finally torque it down and solder the uh, base in the middle leads of the transistor. Or transistors. I forgot one important aspect. Duh! You're going to need to put these isolators in between the collector of the transistor and the bracket. Dolt! Okay, well I've got to put it all back apart and do it again, but I'll, I'll check back in a minute. Okay, so now that we've got the insulation material in between the transistor and the heatsink bracket, we can now start talking down these uh, screws to bring everything nice and flush and tight. Now you don't have to go over torquing these, just till they're snug and they don't really move. That's tight enough, I think, in my opinion. Now, the only thing I don't like about this particular circuit board is the kind of solder mask they've used on it. When you solder to it and it starts burning, it smells like burning rubber. It's horrible. So that's our uh, output stage mounted and you can see there's a small gap there that's how it's supposed to be uh, all the insulation bushings are still there they didn't fall out next would be a good idea to check that the bracket is isolated from the collectors of the transistors so why is it this lead always tangles so the two collectors should be isolated which they are and isolated from the bracket so that's good uh, now we can go ahead and solder the emitters and bases of these two transistors and then call this kit built I might want to clean off some of this uh, flux as well but uh, yeah this might prove a little bit challenging to solder to because it will require a bit of heat. And that's one. Two. Now these um, large bare copper traces here uh, all the way around the back and there's a couple down the front here. I believe you're supposed to fill them with solder, like, you know, wipe solder all over it, as a, um, to improve the high current passing capabilities. Um, yeah, and there's all, they've got all these little holes drilled everywhere all over the circuit board, and some of them are vias, but the others, I don't even know what they're for, but they're there. <coughs> So, we're nearly ready to test this uh, power amp of fire and see how it performs. Now, the thing is, this being class A, as I said previously, they are going to generate a lot of heat even at idle. So, this is not a heat sink. This is just a bracket to mount it to a heat sink. 
So you're really going to have to mount this to a heatsink in order uh, to test this properly. You should never run a Class A amplifier without a heatsink. Well, in fact, you should never really run any amplifier that requires a heatsink without one. So what I'm going to do is this other large heatsink uh, that I bought for another project. I'm just going to temporarily clamp it with a C-clamp or something to the heat sink just to give it some heat transfer. Um, it should work. You could put some compound on here between the two, but I reckon that's going to work just as effectively as it is. I might want to remove this uh, label first though. And this is about as how technical things get here. Uh, just got a G-clamp, C-clamp. Holding the uh, bracket up against the heatsink. I've got two multimeters. One's connected to test point one and ground to measure the uh, halfway point. And this one is a current in current mode going between the VCC line at the input. Power supply is set to 20 volt DC roughly. <laughs> Might drop it off. The maximum is 25, but I'm going to go at 20 volt. Be a little bit conservative. And the current's limited a little, so if it starts drawing shitloads of current for no reason, well, it's not going to do too much damage. So there's no input signal, there's no output load connected. So I'm going to do the first power on test, make sure the output's not shorting against anything. So here we go. Well, it's not drawing much current at all, but I can see that we're at roughly 9 volt, almost halfway. So if we look at the 2 meters, we're about 9.89 volts on the midway point, and we're drawing roughly 200 MA. You can't really see that multimeter too well, but there we go. That might be a bit better. About 230 MA, something around there. The panel meter on the front of the supply is not really showing me much. Okay, so to set the midway point, I've already preset these potentiometers roughly halfway, so we need to adjust KT1 for the voltage point. We want to get it at roughly 10 volt. Now that's obviously the wrong way. So if we watch the meter as I turn this uh, potentiometer to the anti-clockwise position, the voltage is going down and the current is going up. So what I'll do is I'll wind that back the other way, clockwise, until we're sitting roughly at 10 volt, which is about there, about there. So now I need to adjust the current draw. Um, currently it's not getting that warm. So that's this pot here. So what I need to do is first back the current limiting off. So we've got free amount of current flow. And now I'm going to adjust that potentiometer until the current starts increasing. If I so can. It's going up. But not very far. I'm turning that quite fast. We're now 320, 373, 90, 400 MA, 500 MA, 600 MA. We need about 0.8, so 800 MA. That's a bit too far. So I'm going to set it at the lower end, which is 0.8, so 800 MA. Do a heat test, it seems to be all right. Now my midway voltage point, half the VCC seems to have decreased. So I'll increase that. Back to 10. And my current shot up by 10 milliamp. So I'll back that off. See, as soon as you start modifying the current, the uh, VCC drops. Right, so that's pretty much well where I want it to be. We've got 0.8 of an amp, so 800 MA, and we've got 
roughly 10 volts for the halfway point of the output. So now we can actually do an output test. So first, before I connect up anything to the output, I just want to see what the DC offset on the output is, which should be close to zero. Well, actually, it's about three. Oh, it's falling. It's about 2.5, 2.4. 2.2 I've got to let the uh, capacitor charge and stabilize first before I take the final reading um, that is going to happen okay so now it's been running for a little bit it's stabilized to a point where we're at about minus 40 millivolt and if we touch the input of the amplifier we can see the voltage is changing and that's a good indication straight away that that is acting as an amplifier with the good old blurt test. Okay, so let's hook it up to a dummy load and an oscilloscope and the source of audio input and see what this thing can really do. Now, it is running mildly hot whilst idle. I did say that. Uh, the transistors are probably slightly warmer than the bracket, but it is dissipating the heat into the heat sink. Okay, everything's all hooked up. I've got um, a one kilohertz sine wave going in at 300 millivolt, peak to peak, and amplifier is off, so we'll turn it on, have a look at the output on the scope. Well, I can't really see much on the output. We have got a lot of random noise there, however. Oh, hang on, what's going on here? Occasionally it'll output a signal and then it won't. Ah, my lead. It was my lead. There we go. The BNC connection on the uh, DDS wasn't connected properly. See, it's a bit dicky. Just give me two secs, I'll have a look at this. Um, I've got another one, so I'll change it to another one. So after fixing my lead, uh, just doing a heat test on these transistors, it doesn't appear to be getting that hot when driving a load, so. We are now currently at 1.7 volt input, and I can see it's starting to flat top and flat bottom. So if I go any further, you're gonna see that it's gonna start clipping badly, so. Yeah, we're almost in triangle, flat top, square wave at 2.1. So the input sensitivity... Oh, this rotary encoder on this DDS is dicey. So I would say, for totally unclipped, looking about 1.5 volt in. So you can't see on that scale. Uh, I'd say about 1.5 volt in. I'll try and change the times 10 and have another look at that signal. Yeah, it seems all right. So it's not clipping there. So we've got uh, a V peak, uh, peak to peak of 18.65 or so. Um, and the output stage is still reasonably cool it's not getting overly hot neither is the dummy load okay so this original design is supposed to produce 10 watts into 8 ohm supposedly so we're at 18.65 volt which is actually quite good peak to peak considering the supply voltage is 20 so we're only one and a half volts shy of the uh, power rails so you could probably do this on paper and calculate it anyway but Measuring is always a good thing. So we divide that by two to give us our, uh, our V peak. We multiply that by itself. I really wish this particular phone's calculator just allowed you to press the times button and then equals, but it doesn't. Uh, equals 86.9, we'll say, divided by our load, 10.8. So it's right in the ballpark of 10 watt. That's... Uh, 10 watt continuous. Uh, the continuous average power, or 
watts RMS, whatever you want to call it, we're looking at 6.69 volts uh, RMS. Square that equals that divided by a load. I reckon it's going to be about 3 watt. Oh, it's close. 5.5 watt. So it's 5.5 watt continuous average, or as they used to say, watts RMS, which is not correct. Anyhow, so looking at that sonoidal waveform, we can actually see that it's really clean. I can't see any distortion at all. And that's the beauty about Class A amplifiers. You will not have any crossover distortion at all because, as I said previously, that the devices are biased to the point of almost saturation. So they're always biased hard on. So there is no turn-off transients between transistors um, when one turns off and the other one turns on. So you don't get that crossover distortion. So here's your oscilloscope screen. That's the graph. The gradients are in between there for the volts per, di per division and uh, time per division. You've got your sine wave coming in. And it would look something like that. You'd have this period here of uh, a few micro, maybe nanoseconds of a dead flat spot in, in the middle there. If we remove that part of the zero reference line there, you can see that's what you'd expect to see on the screen. That is crossover distortion. That's the turn off transient of the positive going cycles transistor and the turn on transient uh, of the uh, negative going cycles transistor and the time delay in between the two uh, when they're going over the switch point, which you end up with a dead spot in here. Now, some crossover distortion is not as noticeable audibly as others, but Crossover distortion is a nasty artifact and it's just part of the way transistors work. Um, the longer the flat spot in between the two, two uh, positive and negative going cycles, it will result in the output sounding like it's got clicks, pops, snaps and crackles. Uh, sometimes it may sound like it's buzzy. Um, uh, especially on deep bass notes, deep bass notes, etc. And it just sounds terrible. Um, but as we can see on this uh, waveform here, it's a fairly nice, clean waveform at 1.5 volt peak to peak going in. So that's its input sensitivity, which is not bad. And we're getting roughly 10 watts arm, uh, 10 w and we bleh, and we're getting roughly 5 watts continuous average out and 10 watts peak and. Uh, the heat sink's relatively warm. These devices aren't as hot when it's unloaded. Uh, those transistors aren't... Well, that driver transistor, the larger one, is getting slightly warm. The voltage amplifier transistor is dead cold. So, that's working nicely. Uh, so, we probably should hook it up to a speaker. I don't know if I want to risk my desktop speaker. I might hook it up to that crappy 16 ohm speaker I've got. The, the maximum impedance you can put on this is 16 ohm. So at 16 ohm you're only going to get half the output voltage so we'd probably be putting 5 watts into it. Yeah. Okay, got it hooked up to that crappy looking speaker. Well, which is actually quite ironic considering the amplifier is called 1969 and that sort of style of wood grain speaker was prevalent in the 70s. Anyhow, we're hooked up directly to the amplifier now, to that speaker. Turn the load on. There's a slight thump there, but I can't hear anything unusual coming out the speaker. I can hear a bit of circuit noise for the ungrounded input. So, yep, that's working. <laughs> now to hook it up to a source of music. Okay, we're ready for a test. Let's try this piece of music first. Just the volume on the laptop now.
Well, the devices are getting hotter than the bracket. Not by much though. Yeah, that, that's, that's class A for you, that's what happens. Let's try another piece of music now. And we'll just look at a crappy looking speaker. Now, uh, let's see what uh, we can do here. Let's try this one. And even on a speaker from the early to mid 70s, the, the, with a Magnavox driver in it, which I haven't seen in years, it's sounding wonderful. So that's the uh, 1969 uh, John Lindsley Hood clone, Class A amplifier, uh, Chinese kit with the results are pretty good. Um, John Audio Tech, now I have nothing against the guy. Uh, I do enjoy watching his videos and stuff. But uh, for some reason I couldn't figure out why he has so much trouble with these type of kits. It, maybe he's got defective output devices or something. But he said that there was some form of distortion on this amplifier that was not good. I think he was talking more about total harmonic distortion more than anything else. But even at, we're at a volume of 26 on the computer, and that equates to roughly a third of the output power. Now those transistors are getting hot. This is class A. This is what happens. Uh, they sit idle. The transistors get hot. They're almost getting too hot to touch. Um, but it is sinking the heat into the heat sink. Of course, if this had heat sink compound on the back of it and was bolted to it, it would sink it a lot better than just having a C-clamp here. However, as I was saying, the the kits, the amplifier kits that he builds, he seems to find problems with them. I mean, that uh, OCL amplifier I built previously, he had to change a 240 ohm resistor to something more like 470 ohm in the biasing circuit, the self-biasing circuit, because he was measuring crossover distortion and yet when I measured it there was no crossover distortion so I don't know what's going on there um, they're starting to cool down now but uh, yeah I can find absolutely no problems with this this particular amplifier module it sounds great to me um, I can't see any crossover distortion on the output which you won't on class A anyway um, but I can't see any unusual artifacts on the output either so everything seems to be working 
straight out the box, apart from changing those output transistors to probably more um, genuine 2N3055s. Um, but yeah, it's working. It's working great. I can't hear any distortion. Um, yeah, all, maybe a little bit uh, lacking in bass. That was the other thing he found, and I tend to agree with him on that. There is a lack of bass there, um, which could have something to do with one of these capacitors, whichever one of these is actually connected to that 220 ohm resistor on the feedback path of the main input transistor here that sets the frequency roll off so it might be a little bit too high so you'd be rolling the base off a little bit too early however yeah um, it sounds alright I haven't done a frequency response test on it yet and I probably should before I close this video out and I will but yeah I'm quite impressed with the sound quality of the amplifier apart from the base being a bit lacking but it's very straightforward to build um, and set up that just adjusts your current. I would set it at about 0 0.8 or 800 MA idle with no output or input connected so it's completely open and just your uh, output voltage to half. Now of course if you install this in a uh, case with a power transformer around 18 volt you're looking at about 24 to 25 volt which is the maximum VCC input you'd probably have to readjust and recalibrate these pots again. Um, I'm doing it at 19.9 I think is what my voltage is. And I was wondering why the current meter on this power supply wasn't actually showing anything. That's because, well, the way it's wired. The current meter is wired across this post. So if I actually change the positive to the green and the black to the black, uh, I would have a current reading there. In fact, actually I might do that now. Okay, with everything hooked back up, I'll turn the load back on, I've swapped these wires around and now we have a current draw we can see it's at about 800 MA um, except we don't seem to have an output I've got the scope connected but there's no output hmm I know why there's no output it's because the DDS was unplugged, I unplugged it so it wasn't going to interfere with the computer's hard drive or anything that was sitting on top of it so I'll just remove the computer for now. Now we've got an output on the scope so I'm going to now put it into sweep mode and we're going to have a look at the frequency response. Here we go. Yeah, it looks relatively flat, it is fluctuating slightly but not by much. And even at full output voltage it's not drawing much in the way of current either. It's only drawing about 690 MA. So, mm, okay. That's not bad. I am impressed with the uh, the overall um, amplifier itself. It's working as to be expected. I'm going to end this video here. I'll revisit this uh, later when I've got the other module to assemble. And we'll actually hook them up as stereo. I might properly drill the heatsink and mount them properly first. Um, yeah, and we'll we'll take a look at it then. Anyway, thanks for watching. I'm the Astro 30, and as always, if you like this video, please remember to rate, comment, and subscribe below. And you can always follow me on Facebook and Twitter. The links are in the description as usual. Anyways, this is the Astro 30 saying, see ya, have a great day, and I'm not your Darlington.